And thanks so much for tuning in to Morning Live. So uh, getting it uh, going very early this morning. Now, South Africans are outraged at the high levels of violence and criminality plaguing the country at the moment. At least 13 people have been killed in recent incidents of violence aimed at foreign nationals. And demonstrations have also been held countrywide with people expressing their outrage at crimes against women and children. South Africa's National Director of Public Prosecution, Shamila Batoy, joins us now to discuss uh, some of these issues and she took up her position as NPA head in February this year after serving several years as a senior legal advisor at the International Criminal Court. Ms. Batoy, thanks so much for your time this morning. Good morning, Sakina. It's a pleasure to be here. So at the time when um, you assumed office, it was said that this is probably one of the most difficult jobs for anyone to take on at the time. How has it been since you've gotten to office? It's been crazy, <laughs> I think. Um, it's a complicated environment at the moment, um, as you're aware. You know, we in South Africa are facing unprecedented levels of, of corruption, uh, violence against women and children. And so, in as much as the challenges are, are really massive, um, I think the support and, and the um, that I've received and that the NPA has received from so many different contexts make this a very exciting time in terms of trying to address these challenges. Exciting, but of course also very difficult given uh, the climate that exists in the country, given the reputational damage that the NPA had suffered prior to you assuming office. And how is it going on that front? Do you think that you're making any meaningful strides in turning that around? I think most of the, the uh, credibility issues um, were related to um, leadership, um, you know, issues at a leadership level, let me put it that way. And the majority of the prosecutors in the NPA, um, although we have serious issues with vacancy rates, majority of them are really hardworking, dedicated people wanting to serve um, the victims of crime in the best way that they can. So in as much as the NPA has come through a really difficult time, I feel very confident that we'll be able to turn things around and that people will be able to trust and believe in the NPA again. So uh, coming to current events in the country um, and the criminal justice system as a whole of which the NPA is an important cog in that wheel, um, what is your role at this time when we see, you know, a country that is up in flames in certain parts and arrests are being made, but uh, very often there seems to be very little follow through. So as the NPA, perhaps, uh, you know, in explaining and taking South Africans along, what is your role at a time like this? Well, you know, the NPA is and the police, are, you know, reactive in terms of what they do. So in ter once a crime is committed, then the police investigate the crimes. Um, there are dockets that are referred to the National Prosecuting Authority. The prosecutors would then go through the dockets and make sure that there's sufficient evidence to proceed with the case. And then would enroll the case in courts. And then the court process begins. And as you know, the magistrates would then, or the judges would then decide at the end of the day whether the accused is guilty or not. Um, that said, the criminal justice system is... Um, you know, there, there are huge challenges within the system itself. And so, you know, it is a reality that um, very often cases don't get finalized as quickly as, as the victims uh, would like them to, as we within the system would like them to, for various reasons. And so, you know, improving and enhancing the efficiency of the criminal justice system more broadly so that we can deliver the service that victims of this country do deserve. Um, is a high priority for not just the NPA, but for our partners in the greater criminal justice system as well. So what are some of those challenges and impediments? Because as you say, um, people want to see justice to be done. And, and if they have to wait years on end for that to happen, then there might be a sense that uh, justice is being subverted. So what are some of those challenges? Yeah, there, there are really, uh, the challenges within the system itself um, particularly relating to resourcing, I think one of the key challenges is a properly resourced criminal justice system. And that means prosecutors and police to start off with where you have sufficient in terms of numbers, where you have, uh, where you have the relevant skills that you need, um, where you have, uh, you know, uh, a lack, well, there's 
corruption is also within the criminal justice system is also a challenge that we face. And then there are, you know, the backlogs in the courts with the sheer numbers of cases that we have. Um, I think there needs to be a lot more improvement in terms of how cases are managed through the system. And that is not just the responsibility of, of prosecutors. Well, it's actually not the responsibility of prosecutors. Uh, management of cases through the system lies now with, with the magistrates and the, and the, and the judiciary. And, um, you know, we have, an, we have an electronic, we need to have a proper electronic system, case management system, where we can deliver better justice to victims. So people don't come to court often, get simply tired of, of repeatedly coming to courts, cases not being heard. So there's a lot of things that need to be done across the criminal justice system so that we can enhance efficiencies uh, in the, within the system. And of course, you know, when you came in, it was with the view that you would clean up, you would fix and set this entity back on the correct trajectory. And in that regard, because when we talk about backlogs and, uh, you know, staffing issues, those are not new. But, but no. do you actually have the support and the resources, the will to fix those things at the moment? Well, absolutely. Yes, we have the will. You know, and uh, there's been a lot of support, both from within government and without. Um, but no one can be so arrogant as to think they can resolve it themselves. So if you put a national director at the top of the NPA, um, it doesn't mean things are all going to change. But what it means is that we have a new vision, a new direction within the NPA. And as I said, there's a lot of support from within and without. And it's not going to be easy. The challenges are huge, um, but they're not insurmountable. So I feel very confident that things will turn around and um, you know I, I understand that the patience of the country is wearing thin um, but when one considers what we have come through as a country in the recent past um, one cannot expect that things are going to t change overnight but I'm very confident that there are lots of really good people that are willing and supporting the NPA and, and the broader criminal justice system to really start functioning as it should. So I feel, I feel very positive about it. There have been discussions and also concern raised about um, the issue of perhaps getting uh, private uh, funding for the NPA. At what level are those discussions now and is this something that you will be pursuing? This is not a new, a new phenomenon at all. So it's not like I am pursuing it. This has been something that government has Various projects in government have been funded through uh, donor and other types of private funding for many, many, many years. So it's, it's nothing new. Um, so given the current budgetary constraints that not just the NPA, but that the government is facing, we actually need support externally so that we can fund various projects. And I want to make it very clear that uh, support in this, this type of support is really almost exclusively uh, for, um, not for actual prosecutions, but for various sort of um, administrative capacity development, training, and, you know, strategic development, those kinds of, for example, the Tutuzela Care Centers, which is, when in, when, with regard to sexual and gender-based crimes, is in fact, is almost a, a, a best practice internationally, was almost totally funded by external donor funding and continues to be so. When one looks at the specialized commercial crimes courts, which were set up many years ago, Business Against Crime, um, very, very heavily supported and, and assisted with the funding of that initiative. So, and this is not just in the NPA, it's across government, there are various projects that are being funded. But of course, we have to make sure that the perception that the NPA is not being captured, um, you know, so we are acutely aware of that. Um, and that any, is the concern, given that you yourself mentioned the issue of corruption yes. and the fact that this could severely hamper independence. Um, you know, as you say, that perception is a very important one. No, absolutely. And that is why, you know, there are provisions within the government framework and treasury regulations to ensure that um, these, uh, this type of funding is managed very transparently, that there's accountability as far as this is concerned. And so that we take very, very seriously as well. Mm. Just coming back to uh, the current situation on the ground with uh, the femicides that we see, the violence against women and children, and of course uh, these uh, xenophobic flare-ups as they've been described. Uh, 
have there been any discussions that included yourselves at this point um, <clears throat> with other stakeholders in this regard, the SAPS, uh, Durko, Home Affairs, with regard to how to speedily move on the matters at hand? Yes, I had a meeting with the National Commissioner of Police just yesterday um, and with three of his very senior managers, um, together with uh, two of my very senior managers, um, just to look at how we could we could, sexual and gender-based crimes has always been a priority uh, for the National Prosecuting Authority and for government. But clearly, more needs to be done. And so we had a meeting yesterday to look at how we can reprioritize these matters, how we can try to fast-track them through the system. Um, they're, they're cases that, uh, <coughs> for example, looking at the backlogs of cases, looking at cases that have been withdrawn, looking at why these cases were withdrawn, whether there's, you know, if there was um, any um, outstanding investigations, uh, to look at how these cases can be b brought back onto the role. There was an anti-rape strategy that was developed by, by SAPS um, some, some years back. They're re-looking at that to broaden it to sexual and gender-based crimes. Um, and we are going to be working with them to ensure that, um, you know, government has lots of great strategies and plans, but... Uh, it's implementation is where where we fail so to look at how could we actually ensure that these these great plans are properly implemented and that cases are fast tracked through the system so that you know they are um, it, you know they are dealt with efficiently speedily and also the issue of bail has also been released we talked about that and talked about you know bail is granted by magistrates and not by prosecutors but certainly with these very serious offences, uh, prosecutors will object to bail. And in the event that <coughs> bail is granted, we will certainly look at requesting the magistrates to enforce very strict bail conditions um, so that we send out a very strong message um, that, you know, we are serious about tackling these cases in a, in a more efficient manner. And um, <clears throat> I know we need to let you go shortly, so I'm just going to try and move through a few other uh, issues very quickly. Um, with regard to the current uh, Commission of Inquiry and um, what's going on at the State Capture Commission of Inquiry in particular, um, are there any prosecutions that you are currently working on with regard to what has been revealed there thus far? Well, we, we're working on a number of investigations, let me, let me put it that way. Um, there are a number of prosecutors. In fact, at the moment, I am, we are currently, I have all the directors of public prosecutions, the, the regional heads of the specialized commercial crimes units, and uh, we are at the moment, in fact, for two days, we are looking at the NPA um, anti-corruption uh, strategy in terms of, you know, just the organizing ourselves because we are very constrained with regard to resources, etc., to look at how we can do more with what we have. And what has emerged, but, is that there's really a number of cases that are already on the court rolls involving corruption, um, private sector as well as government corruption across the country. Um, and we're looking at how we could better um, capacitate the prosecutors to fast track these cases so that they move a bit more quickly through the system. But in addition to that, the directorate, investigating directorate has just been set up. Um, I must say it's, it's not been that easy to actually capacitate the directorate, um, but there are a number Why of... Why not? Um, I think it's, you know, we have very specific government regulations when it comes to recruiting people into, um, you know, into government. And so we've had to look at how we could get deviations from Treasury regulations, etc., to ensure that we can capacitate uh, the directorate very quickly. Of course, there's been the funding issue as well. But that's been more or less resolved, and so there is funding to ensure that um, you know, it is properly capacitated. And you need various skills, different types of skills, in addition to legal skills, forensic skills, forensic investigation skills, analytical skills, project management skills. So there's a whole range of disciplines that's required. But certainly, Advocate Cronier has been working really hard. We have teams together that are working on many of the cases that have been uh, mentioned in, in the State Capture uh, Commission. And uh, when we have sufficient evidence, we will proceed. Um, and, and I guess this is part of the frustration because when people come, like you had an Angelo Agriti, for example, who comes there, <clears throat> sings like a canary, and uh, people sit and they wonder, okay, 
at what point do we start seeing action? People come and level very serious allegations against others. And, you know, the public sits there and wonders, at what point do we see the wheels of justice start to move? Um, you know, maybe you can just explain to the public mm -hmm. then, uh, just to allay those fears that nothing is being done, how the process actually works. When we see someone on the television giving evidence before the State Capture Commission of Inquiry, what is your role? How does the process unfold? It's very different. It's very, uh, you know, having a person, uh, you know, testify before a commission is very different from actually putting together a watertight case. And so in addition to many of the witnesses that have appeared in the State Capture Commission and other commissions, that's not the only one, um, it's really one, one really small aspect of trying to put a watertight case together. And so, you know, there's a whole lot of forensic investigation that has to take place. And, um, you know, you need to, you know, people actually tend to forget that what has happened in the past couple of years has actually resulted in the system being, um, you know, there was a deliberate attempt to ensure that many cases actually did, never saw the inside of courtrooms. And so now we need to actually put together cases where it's not just about, you know, there's forensic evidence, as I said, and there's a whole, you, to put a watertight case together is, is a really complex issue. And we need to ensure that when we do bring these cases, we have sufficient evidence that they are watertight and that they are actually not going to be withdrawn or that we're going to fail. Failure is not an option. So in order to build these watertight cases involving very, very complex schemes often is not as simple as someone just coming there and saying, this is what I know about a case. So, but what we can assure the people of the country is that there's a lot of very, very hard work going on behind the scenes. And when we do have the evidence, we will proceed. And of course, we will continue this conversation because uh, many questions to be asked. You have um, uh, someone like Harry Nell, for example, um, with Afri Forum now, who would contend that sometimes the NPA needs to be pushed uh, to actually uh, get going with some of these cases. And it is often as a result of pressure in some of these matters that the NPA does act and will get the National Director of Public Prosecutions to perhaps opine on that as we continue this conversation after news headlines. But for now, over to you, Leanne.